Carmen. I'm one of the head speech coaches um, at Columbus East, and I'm entering my ninth year there. But in my other life, I um, direct the communication program at IUPUC in Columbus um, and advise all of our students there and have been coaching discussion since I came, up, or came on board um, nine years ago. Um, and so I thought I would share for those of you that are new, those of you that are returning, some of this might be a bit of a repeat. To give you an idea of the history of discussion, if you heard JD earlier, um, the, the, d this event has gone through many iterations, even in the nine years um, that I've been here, but I think the iteration that it's in now um, seems to be working um, and it seems to be something students are getting something out of. So what I did with the handout, um, that I attached to um, the classroom site is that it, it breaks everything down for you. And I also attached um, two sample artifacts um, that would be artifacts that I would consider using um, at a tournament. And I'm gonna put a caveat on this before I start and that I have not given much thought as to what virtual discussion would look like yet. Uh, so those are questions for um, later. Um, but discussion was initially based as almost a policy debate round using questions of policy where students were defining problems and solutions, um, talking, particularly looking at the quality of research. Um, but at that time, discussion was highly structured. People were coming in with pre-prepared speeches. It wasn't actually a discussion as much as it was who could give the most pre-prepared speeches um, and make it look like it made sense. Um, and then in 2009, um, ju just as I came to the IHSFA, um, they did away with that structure and moved to a um, consensus building structure so that there would be um, a loose question and answer structure, but focus on building um, consensus within the group, getting the group to agree with what was going on. Um, but what we found there is, yes, there was less structure, less pre-prepared speeches and more spontaneity. We also found that there were shorter discussion rounds, rounds that were lasting 10 minutes and sometimes less, um, and that there was a lot of strategizing that was going on outside the room before students even entered the room. Um, and so that spontaneity there was going back and forth. So then we moved to the current style, um, which is a Socratic seminar. Um, and students are really tend to be familiar with this subject, tend to be familiar with this format uh, because it's something that they use in school. I like this format because this is how I teach all of my classes at the college level. I think it's a practical way to think about it. Um, and so what happened with this is that students are provided with artifacts uh, before the rounds, the week before the round, the tournament happens, and then they're asked to analyze them. And in that analysis, um, they are doing some research, but not necessarily so much research that they're preparing speeches. Um, and they are, it tends to be more philosophical and more, um, there's a lot of spontaneous conversation um, that happens. Uh, and so what we're giving the students to do, what we're allowing the students to do and empowering them to do is to create meaning of a text. Um, and that text could be anything that the tournament host comes up with. The two artifacts that I came up with um, this week or the two texts um, one was an infographic about um, shocking facts related to the America, America's prison system, uh, particularly as they disadvantage people of color. And then the second one I picked was a poem um, called Counting um, that looks at the idea of the census taking and counting people and what that looks like. Um, so what you'll find often is that the artifacts or the text that the students receive um, have to do with current events at the time uh, to get them thinking um, in the current way, but also critically analyzing the news and the research that they are um, 
coming in contact with. Um, when we run our practices, usually for the first several weeks of the season, um, we give our students artifacts to prep as if they were prepping a tournament for a tournament and have them look at those. And we pick things that are current. Um, the one thing I would be leery of is I will say the students start to burn out on some of the topics um, that come up over and over um, and over again. And the discussions tend to be the same. Um, so if you're hosting a tournament, choosing a variety of artifacts that differ from week to week um, will benefit uh, the students. So for new coaches, this is one of those events that doesn't really have a clear way to prepare students. You know, we can talk about pros, they get, they get a text, you work on cutting it down, and then they work on interpreting it, and it's pretty clear how that works. Um, discussion is something the students have to prepare for each week, um, and it's different each week. Um, which is important. And so I put some suggestions there for preparing students for what um, the Socratic seminar will look like for them. Um, and the number one thing I have to encourage you, and I've been, I've not done this too, is to make sure your students get the artifacts as far in advance as possible. So when they're posted on that Monday, encouraging the students either to go to Speechwire um, and download them, or if you don't have your students do that, making sure that you email them out so that they have the full week to be able to give whatever the topic is the full treatment. Um, and so ways that I suggest having your students prepare is first doing a line by line reading of the text. Um, we always tell our students to make sure that they come to that first practice that week, having looked at the artifacts, knowing what they are and bringing printed copies um, with them so that we have that as a basis uh, for when they actually get to practice with us. Both Matt and I um, are in our building, uh, so we don't see our students um, on a regular basis. So making sure that they have that done before they see us. And then I have them look up or highlight any definitions of words or concepts that they might be familiar with. Um, and that can be as simple as vocabulary words uh, from the poem or other words that they may not have seen before. I ask them to consider the context of the piece. So look up who the author is, um, what's the history of the prison system in the US and things of that nature. And then I ask them to contextualize it in today's society. If, if it is a historical piece, what is the relevance to today? Um, a random piece of history wasn't just chosen to be talked about in discussion. There's a reason why it was chosen. And so what is its relevance to today? And then what is, what is their take on the artifact? Um, and encouraging your students to have different takes on the artifact. Um, having discussions where your same discussers on the same team can disagree with each other is really helpful before they go to the tournament. Um, and being able to articulate um, what those are. You may want to encourage your students to do some research. It's certainly not required or expected, but it doesn't hurt for students to have small files with them. And I'm not talking about extent files where everything is filed under topic, um, but I do encourage uh, students to look for critiques of poems, um, maybe to look for some background information about the infographic or things that are particularly interesting to them. Um, we provide our discussers with a binder so they can put paper in there. They can put uh, their hard copy of the artifact. And then behind the artifact, they can put any resources um, that they might have. Um, our discussers last year used Google Drive and created folders each week for each artifact so that the students could share um, any research that they were doing um, that way. And that seemed to be really helpful for them. So the perennial question that is always asked in this event is how do you win, right? Students are gonna ask you, how do I win and what am I judged on? Um, and so, First is the relevance of information. Are they bringing, are the students bringing in outside information, outside experience to the topic? 
are they analyzing the topic or are they sort of staying at that very surface level? Are they participating in a collaborative way with their peers? And I, what I want you to highlight here is collaborative, not consensus. Um, if students get really frustrated when they know that they are going into this not to build consensus, but to have a collaborative discussion, and somebody in the round inevitably says, and we've reached consensus, so can we move on? Um, the participation should be collaborative in nature, but the students don't have to agree. And then is their delivery uh, professional in nature? Um, I've judged a round where I had a student participant fall asleep in the round. I've judged rounds where students have rolled their eyes in visible disdain for other people. Um, and that all plays into um, that adherence to um, the format. Are there questions? Oh, are there questions at this point about what the event is from those of you that are new coaches? I know I'm looking at a lot of faces that I've seen before. So essentially the short breakdown is the students get the artifacts on usually Monday or Tuesday. They have the week to prepare. And then Saturday when they get to the meet or get on the meet, however that's going to look, uh, the judge will have a list of four to five open-ended questions related to the artifacts for um, the discussion. Um, and once the students feel like they've given a question the fair treatment, um, they can ask the judge for the next question. The judge is not a participant in the round. They are simply the facilitator. So they shouldn't be contributing their own opinion. They should not be asking questions and going rogue. Um, any number of things have happened um, with discussion judges in the past. Um, in terms of tips to provide your students, um, encouraging them to bring paper with them to the round. Um, I know that this probably seems common sense, but I've showed up to many a round where their students have shown up with themselves, no artifact, no paper. Um, so making sure that they are um, prepared to have that discussion. Please don't have them prepare speeches in advance. That defeats the purpose um, of this event um, and really leads to a lack of discussion more than actual discussion. Um, and then to um, be respectful yet assertive. Um, and this one is hard. Um, students should be told that they should be critiquing other people's ideas, not the individual. Um, and so I think sometimes when discussions get heated, if we're talking about sensitive topics, gun control, uh, politics, I'm sure as we move towards the election in, um, in November and whatever the outcome of that is, um, people take their opinions very seriously and our students get heated and I think often attack each other and not the ideas. And encourage your students not to interrupt for interruption's sake. Um, I think a lot of times students think in order to get the one in a discussion round, they have to talk the most. Um, and so they do that by interrupting their peers um, simply so that they can talk. The person who should get the one in the discussion round is one who not only contributes to the discussion a reasonable amount, but is also integrating the ideas of other people without interrupting them and allowing um, others to um, speak and to disagree without being disagreeable. It doesn't mean that the person or student comes in the room and disagrees with everything that comes out of somebody's mouth. Is to think about how a student can disagree um, and provide support for their disagreement. Their attire and behavior should resemble that of any other um, speech event that we have. I did include some suggestions for running discussion at your own tournament um, and thinking about the artifacts that you can choose. The world is sort of your oyster when it comes to this, but I would say the most common types of artifacts that we see are newspaper articles or media articles. 
um, pictures with captions from popular news sources, uh, pieces of art and photography are always popular, uh, music lyrics. Um, you can use a, a movie clip or an audio clip. My only caution with that is that generally in the round, um, the judge won't be able to see a live clip of what is going, what the artifact actually is. So it may make it challenging to judge the round. M memes, um, political cartoons and infographics um, also work. Um, and if you want to be creative, some kind of object. Um, and I encourage you to be careful with objects. I will never forget the discussion round um, that we went to with a student um, where they were given a blank sheet of paper as their artifact, a literal white sheet of paper. Um, and that, while it leaves a lot open, artifacts by smell, yes. Oh, good Lord. And fortune cookies are popular, correct. Uh, but a blank sheet of paper, while ambiguous, and I'm encouraging your artifacts to have some level of ambiguity, a white sheet of paper is a little too ambiguous, especially for some um, of our novice uh, discussers. Um, and lastly here, I pointed out um, some suggestions about questions. I will tell you that the biggest complaint students often have is about the questions in the round, not the artifact. Um, a yes or no question gives you a yes or no answer. So that does not lead to much discussion. Um, so making sure that you're using how and why questions and questions that don't have a right answer. Please don't ask a question that asks them to identify a fact from the, from the artifact. Again, there's one answer um, there. Um, I encourage you to use thought provoking and controversial questions maybe counter what the artifact has and suggest having them talk about that um, and making sure that there is no right answer. The point of the discussion, again, remember, is for them to analyze the topic from lots of uh, different angles. And the best way to do that is to um, have them have no right answer um, to the question. Um, I think the sweet spot per round is five to six questions. Um, I don't like the fifth question to be, what else would you like to say about this artifact? Um, so if you're really attached to what else would you like to say about this artifact, I would make sure that you have five other questions um, just so that the discussion is actually a discussion and not a 15 minute, let's chat and then they leave the room. Does anyone have questions for me or comments from how they've seen discussion progress under this format? I, I would say A plus to taking it to Socratic. Not only is it what's more relevant to what, especially juniors and seniors and are seeing in the classroom, but certainly for the kids who go on to college. What has stumped uh, our students uh, sometimes are the artifacts that are lyrics mm -hmm. because the lyrics are printed, you hear the music, and as we know, there's a reason that lyrics and the, mu and the melody go together to make the music. And they get into implying meaning with the combined melody and, mu and lyrics and I kind of hit, no, guys, they just sent you the lyrics. They didn't send you the melody. They sent you the lyrics. Um, that, and my guys go down these bunny holes, and it's hard to pull them back. Um, I know I need more help in how to coach discussion. Um, ugh, they have really, and, and agreed, please, if you really are desperate for a fifth question, <laughs> ask a friend, ask someone in the, in the teacher's workroom or around the coffee pot, <laughs> please don't put that. And do you have any, that drives my kiddos crackers. They immediately look at that after they get in the, or they hear it in the round and that's the eye roll. So I agree with that. Um, Ideas on how to coach this, Anna. 
Well, let me answer one question and then I'll bring that to the group. Linda just asked, can an editorial be an artifact? An editorial is a perfect artifact. Um, I often use the New York Times editorial section online to select artifacts for meets that we're hosting. So editorials are definitely um, good artifacts. Suggestions on coaching. I want to open it to the floor because I know there are a lot of successful coaches that have coached this event that are in this room right now. Matt, do you want to talk about your suggestion that you just typed? Sure. Um, at a certain point, I'm taking my mask down because I need it. Um, at a certain point um, in the process, uh, you know, your your discussers are going. Your discussers are going to have a lot of. You're going to become experienced relatively quickly. It usually takes about eight or eight or twelve rounds of competition for them to become successful. Um, and in those cases, what, what we like to do um, is we like to. You know, they will we'll give me artifacts on like, you know, they'll get, they'll get the artifacts on Monday so that by practice on Tuesday, and when we practice with them, you know, we can sit down with them and say, okay, so what do you think this is going to be? You know, what do you think the questions are going to be? How do you think this discussion is going to go? Because by then they should be, they're going to be able to kind of suss that out. Um, and so, you know, on a, on, a, on a Tuesday, you know, they get together in a group and they talk things over. And then on, by the time we go to practice on Thursday, after they've sat with things for a couple of days, we go, okay, now, now write down what you think the questions are going to what do you, what questions do you think the whoever's whoever's in charge of discussion that week? What do you think? What do you think the questions are going to be? And um, and that's that's a way to, to flip that's a way to flip it. You know, to, we you know we all flip our classrooms and we transform our classrooms. Let's flip discussion. Turn it, put it back in their hands, and make them think about how how might we how might we talk about this? And what kind of questions? What kind of questions does it provoke in me? And are these questions that we can kind of we can go go down and, and can we answer these questions? And then all of a sudden they, they find themselves suddenly relatively prepared for Saturday. The other thing we've also had some success doing is pairing your discussers with your extempers, mm -hmm. um, especially with current event um, artifacts. Um, if your extempers are pulling a variety of files related to current events, they're going to be able to help the not discussers who are likely to become your extempers at some point analyze that and have some background with that and we found that that mentorship has really been uh positive on our team too other ideas hey i'm uh i'm new to the group my name is brian welcome brian <laughs> I'm a first year coach. Um, it might take me about a minute to explain myself here. Um, I do Socratic seminars in my economics classroom. Like we'll watch a, a video on the rat race or something like that, or college tuition inflation or healthcare in the United States. And they have to um, think of three questions related to the video, like a factual question, an inferential question, and a universal question. And then when we do Socratic seminars, we sit in a circle of 10 and I have like a tennis ball and you can only speak if you have the tennis ball type situation. And then, <laughs> and then uh, they, they ask each other their inferential and universal questions, like the deep level three level three uh, uh, questions. So I never ask them questions, but they ask each other questions and they're really deep questions usually unless the topic matters, college tuition, inflation, and they don't have a lot of background information about it, you know? <laughs> um, but so I'm really interested in this Socratic seminar format as a new coach. How does it look like in a competition setting? I mean, is it 10 kids sitting around in a circle with a tennis ball? <laughs> What's it look like? So it's not ever bigger than seven students. So it is seven students sitting around in a circle um, and they all have name tags in front of them with their competition code on it. They will have all have the artifacts. And so once everybody is situated in the room and the judge usually sits, can sit in the circle or outside the circle, but they're not a participant. And when everybody is ready, the judge reads the first question and the discussion commences. Um, I think sometimes a tennis ball might be nice. 
Um, but it is the students who moderate their own or her, their own conversation. But I want to say that there is no assigned moderator to the discussion. So you don't get extra points for saying you're going to moderate the discussion or mediate the discussion. And then the students talk amongst themselves while the judge watches. Once they feel like they are um, given that question, the best that they can give it, they ask for the next question. And it goes on like that until either the hour happens or they've reached the end of all five questions. Do they and get do they get reduced points for interrupting? It de it depends is the answer to that question and that that's where some of the subjectivity and discussion judging happens is that interrupting for interrupting sake should be reduced but interrupting in a way to move the conversation along may not. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it looks really intriguing. I'm really looking forward to this. So, I mean, we just anticipate what they might ask question-wise. Can you ask that again? We just anticipate what the judges might ask on that day. Yes. Okay. And that's where Matt said is that actually uh, uh, having students come up with the questions ahead of time will better prepare them for that. And oftentimes we may, if you have more than one discussor on a team, one discussor may be responsible for writing three questions that they may anticipate for one artifact. The other one will do another artifact and then they trade and answer them so that they can really see what um, the difference is. That works really well um, when you have an upperclassman and a lowerclassman. Um, there's also a lot of conversation going on in the chats about sharing information. Um, I will say that on our team, we have some people who do all their research and don't share it. We have some that will research and they don't care if other people have it. Um, I, so Chad was asking that question. Yeah, and some years you're gonna have really communal kids and then some years you're gonna have that senior that wants to pummel your freshman. Uh, or a junior that wants to pummel their freshman. We had it last year. So um, it depends on sort of that. And JD says, when you practice, you assign a jerk in the round. We do that too. Um, we will often have other members of our team be the jerk. So the constant interrupter, we will have somebody be a person who does not talk. Um, and how do you get people involved in the conversation? Um, and then we may have a devil's advocate that just says the opposite of whatever anybody else says. Um, Matt says interpreters work well for jerks. Yes, they do because they like to play the role. Um, so that works a lot of times. And I will say on our weeks off, the kids that are in those memorized events do like to do something a little bit different. Um, it's obviously low stress. And at the same time, we're still thinking critical thinking skills and talking about world events. Um, so I know our kids like to do that a lot. They see discussion as this enigma that they can do at practice, but they don't want to do at an actual meet. Other ideas or questions? It looks like Dave McKenzie's teaching. Of seven in the circle, how many are on the same team? Ideally, you would have one person from a team if you go to a small meet and say there's only three or four sections of discussion, which is very rare, usually discussion has the most people or most students registered in it, um, you may have a student hit a student from another school. And it's up to your students how they want to tackle it. They could be independent, they could play off of each other. Um, it's sort of up to them. Is it about group success or individual student success? I think it's a combination of both. The individual success is going to lead to the collaborative conversation among the group. Jeannie, were you gonna say something? <laughs> I gotta wake up here, Anna. Come on, not enough Diet Coke yet. Um, when I have had successful um, students in discussion, it is, always because when they take the character within a competitive round at a meet of going towards mm, not so much consensus 
as as this mary you haven't spoken what do you think not mary don't you understand the topic um i.e the jerk but <laughs> well yeah i have some not so kind seniors that we have to reel back in oh. sometimes um go ahead some someone else is going to say something Oh, Mary, I'm so glad you're the good listener. Uh, but you always have something to say, Mary. And so my kids try the successful ones in the past to work off the new knowledge that's been presented, things that they, points of view they didn't um, examine uh, in the topic beforehand or the, or the way someone presented what they, my student thought they knew in a different fashion. And they will then ask uh, how did you get to that? Ex can you explain that to me? Again, in discussion, I've also found its tone of voice. Mm -hmm. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That really is the deal. That's all, Anna. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I think we're already over our session time. I knew a half hour was going to be pushing it to get everything in. But I appreciate, if you have any questions, uh, my... Uh, contact information is above the handout. Um, if you're running a tournament and would like help picking out discussion artifacts, I never have a problem uh, doing that and writing questions. Um, so feel free to um, reach out. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>